um, the topics of which are primarily guided by state statute. When we looked at and reviewed the policies, we wanted to make sure we took a systematic approach, meaning understanding the relationship across the different chapters, how they interact together, and helping us to focus um, our policies based on that. As well as looking at health in all policies, are we producing um, positive public health outcomes uh, from what we're trying to achieve? Um, as well as we had an equity lens, and really what we mean by that is, as we uh, make decisions, we need to understand where there are gaps in access to resources, um, and are we making decisions um, based on that full information. So to get into some of the key changes by chapter, uh, for future land use, one of, the, one of the key changes is really identifying how we want to focus the growth. We know we're growing as a population. How do we want to, to address that? So we really wanted to focus growth in activity centers and mixed use corridors. And that's a shift a little bit from what we refer to now as sector planning. And that's essentially um, just saying that's more directly determine how we want to uh, grow out, uh, build out. And that is allowing for areas that infrastructure can support development and redevelopment, that we're creating walkable communities, that we're creating a density that can support transit, that we have proximity of uses for convenience of our residents and workers. Um, and so that's really what those types of uh, centers and corridors can do. We have a new land use category um, called Plan Redevelopment District, which is in line with that, but allows for a transition between low and high density areas. So really, again, a lot of these issues focus um, around how do we want to focus our development. Uh, we also want to create this community planning process that uh, allows us to consistently look at different areas of the community. Um, it's, we scale the process to the, to the size of the area we're planning for, but we want to introduce that process. Um, we also removed some direct um, policies that talk, talked about uh, US 19 corridor or the fixed guideway transit or what have you. And the reason for that is because we, the comprehensive plan is really intended to say, yes, we support corridor planning, but we're not going to be listing every corridor that we're planning for in the comprehensive plan. But the, the plan really guides the fact that you can look at these types of activities and move forward with that. We also call, uh, newly call for a food access strategic plan. It's really trying to understand where there are gaps in the system, uh, what communities have uh, minimum access to healthy foods. So how do we make recommendations to, to improve that situation? A big part of uh, land use is connected to housing as well. And how do we improve our housing stock, make sure we're addressing affordable housing needs. And there are land use decisions like addressing missing middle so, or uh, really the, those uh, types of homes that may not be in place today that expand our housing stock and options. We also wanted to make uh, the ability to address affordable housing a little bit more achievable. And currently in the plan, uh, we have a, a cap for looking at an, a density bonus incentive. While we still want to look at that incentive and we mentioned the density bonus, we've removed that cap to allow our land development code to really determine what are the different situations where you would have different levels of, of density allowable for affordable housing. And so a lot of the incentives that we're proposing or recommending, we should say, to look at um, really would be carried out through those implementing tools like the Land Development Code. And so again, connected to housing, we really stress the coordination um, with our municipal partners. How do we achieve and address the issue countywide? And so we call out the, the, the strategy of participating in the countywide housing strategy. Uh, and again, uh, other incentives are addressed in the housing section. How do we help off offset costs? So all of these are the things that kind of direct us for what should we be looking at and how it's carried out happens outside of the comprehensive plan. Um, and I'll just mention that we, we remove some of the specific um, entities like a community land trust or, or uh, other items, but it, it's really to make sure that the policies support what those things are trying to achieve but we don't feel the need to call them out within the plan itself. Before you go on to the next page. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, the, how much of in depth do you go on each section as far as uh, recommendations or actually specific policy items? Or I, I'm thinking specifically on the food access yeah. strategic plan um, and our food desert areas yeah. and, and how we address those, whether it's zoning or, or 
uh, variance recommended. How kind of yeah. give me a little bit more meat on that bone? Sure. So the intention is really the way it's drafted is to understand initially where the issues are, where are the gaps, what you know, what are the needs that need to be filled. So the intention of the strategic plan is to assess that and then make the recommendations. So it's really working with um, partners within within the county and organize, organizations within the county to understand what the need is and then looking at best practices and other things that have happened. So the plan itself doesn't make the specific recommendations. Okay, that's and, where I was going. Yeah, I think the, the good piece to remember here, this is a 10-year a plan. And so if you call out an issue, then there's specific strategies that will be developed um, in a different document, like, for instance, a food security document or something that's more specific to the different areas of the county that can be adjusted over time. You don't have to amend your comprehensive right. plan each time you look at a different area. And that's and we've seen it in other issues, but with this one, it was, it was new, and so I, I wanted to just kind of get a better frame for it. Thank you. Thank you. Similar question about the housing strategy. So sure. will we have a separate housing yeah. strategy that we can amend if we, because I think we're, I mean, we know we're in a crisis right now and we may be, need to be a bit more nimble than we have been, <laughs> you know, yeah. and to look at some creative things. Um, so I just want to make sure that this is not it, it's presenting exact, a barrier to any of that. Yeah, it's exactly that. It says who, who we should be working with our partners to create this overall strategy. And it's really, again, the implementation tools, whether it's an ordinance or a land development code regulation or so forth, that really sets the specifics of any of these actions. OK. But OK. OK. So um, in our economic prosperity section, we really um, we expanded uh, some of the language to, again, look at those areas of the community that may be underserved, uh, want to protect small businesses. Uh, of course, we're continuing to um, assess the need for target industry and how do we attract them? Uh, how do we make a business climate um, that is uh, welcoming to different levels of our businesses? Looking at, uh, it directs us to look at um, uh, the you know potential barriers that we have in place and how do we address those so one of the big things that we've done is add to our goal the the idea of equity and what that means here essentially is um, are, do we have the information in place to, to understand that then guide our decisions um, that we're not impacting specific communities or specific businesses or specific areas of the county with the decisions and programs that we make. Um, so one of the things I, I want to highlight here is that we're, we're proposing an economic prosperity strategic plan. And really, it's to start with that data and that analysis and then make recommendations for the different, uh, the different elements of our local economy. Again, whether it's target industry, workforce training, how do we support our small businesses in different areas of, of the community. Uh, and the one other thing I'll mention here, because it, it, it's, um, uh, it goes in line with what the role of the comprehensive plan is, is that we're removing, um, I believe there was a specific jobs target uh, identified in the plan. Metrics will be a big part of any of the programs that we do, but the specific, we don't want to go through a comp plan amendment if we want to change the specific target. So that was removed from the plan itself. So for transportation, one of the key shifts is uh, while we still very much are, as we plan our transportation system, we look at efficiency, but we really stressed the, uh, the notion of looking at safety as our number one priority. So we identify policies consistent with Vision Zero or Safe Streets Pinellas where we're trying to limit traffic related um, injuries or fatalities and how do we reduce that um, and how do we plan our network while considering safety as a key issue. Uh, we also are looking at supporting transit. How do we um, plan our areas in ways that can can support additional transit, improve that system, uh, lowering vehicle vehicle miles traveled? And th this is an example of um, one of those cross issues that goes across different chapters. You want to lower vehicle miles travel by um, providing different opportunities for people to move around the county, whether it's sidewalks or, or, or bike lanes or trails or, or what have you. 
um, to t take cars off the road. Well, that also is a natural resource issue, and how do we um, reduce emissions associated with that as well? So it sets strategies to look at those things. Um, also here, and this is, some, this is an example of what we've done um, at different points in the document, is that we removed old uh, DOT standards associated with um, some of the uh, uh, roadway requirements. There, again, those are regulatory tools, so they don't belong in the comprehensive plan, but we still use and recommend this context-specific approach. How do we look at the facilities for the specific area we're looking at, and what are the right facilities for that area, and we'll set the standards associated with that. Um, we also um, look at uh, how do we plan for the future? Are there technologies? As we build out our infrastructure, um, can we support alternative modes and technologies in that process? So moving on to natural resource and resources and conservation, uh, what I'd like to highlight here is something I believe you've seen already, and it supports the creation and implementation of a sustainability and resiliency action plan for the county, um, looking at a, a cross-section of, of environmental issues and other issues that can support resiliency of the county, and that is identified um, as, a, as a strategy to utilize in the comprehensive plan. Uh, we also look at an urban forestry master plan that should be implemented, looking at our tree canopy system, and which affects a number of things, whether it's air quality or stormwater runoff or um, heat island situations. So essentially, let's look at what the issues are through this master plan and make recommendations of how we can address that. And then we look at um, county facilities and, and, and our fleet uh, and seeing how can we move into the future to be more um, environmentally sound with our decisions there. So for coastal management, um, a, our goal continues to be reducing risk and, and limiting uh, impacts. Uh, but for the goal language itself, we've added reduced risk from sea level rise, flash floods, and climate-related impacts. So that kind of guides a lot of the policies that are in the document. Uh, we um, were working with emergency management, and they recommended that we have um, a 50-hour estimate for evac times um, during hurricane or storm events. Uh, in the current plan, it's, it simply says reduce from 55 hours. And it also set an unrealistic target of 16 hours. Uh, so working with emergency management, they recommended that it be 50 hours consistent with a regional statewide report that had come out in 2020. Um, and essentially how that works is that, that 50 hours is backed into. Um, so when a storm event is, is happening, they work backward from when they expect that to happen, when tropical force winds will be in the county, and they work backwards to determine that 50 hours. And of course, the board has the opportunity or is required to um, say when that 50 hour notice to the public occurs. Um, we also um, remove uh, policies associated with uh, notifying uh, RV parks and transient accommodations and such. Uh, from this comprehensive plan, because that's something that's addressed in the county code. Um, so getting into our coastal high hazard area or in a coastal storm area, a consistent uh, effort throughout the document is to say, use the latest and greatest information to guide our decisions. Um, so we've done that for the coastal high hazard area. Also, just use the latest modeling, what's available to us that will help uh, determine what that boundary is. Um, and so for the coastal high hazard area essentially explains where there's flooding impacts uh, from hurricane events or storm events. And so we as a county, as a peninsula, we have other areas that are flooded beyond that boundary. And so we've created a coastal storm area to further protect that. One thing that we considered is adding an additional zone or a coastal A zone um, that has just recently been mapped for the first time because it has, imp it has potential impacts from flooding. We haven't fully been able to uh, understand the impact on what properties are affected by that additional boundary. So we're not moving forward with that just yet, even though we considered that. Uh, but it is something that we'll probably bring to you in the future as we further understand the impact associated with expanding the definition of what the coastal storm area is. Uh, we also recommend um, different items um, and strategies to protect our public infrastructure uh, from sea level rise and climate events. So in the surface water management section, um, big thing is just calling out the implementation of a stormwater manual. It certainly doesn't 
identify the specifics of what has to be in it, but it sets up the notion that we should be implementing a manual that provides alternatives to treatment and so forth. Um, so any changes that uh, we as a community would, or a county would make to that manual, again, happens outside of the comprehensive plan. In the recreation, open space, and culture section, um, some of the big changes really just has to do with, again, adding that equity approach, identifying where there are gaps in our system, and how do we um, potentially address those situations. We set up criteria for when uh, we de determine how we want to um, pursue land acquisition, uh, looking at environmental concerns, again, gaps in the system, are we connecting those, et cetera. Um, and we expand our historical and cultural resource protection policies, and it has a lot to do with tracking and documentation of our resources. And there's also a strategy to really identify when it's the appropriate time to require an archeological survey as, as we redevelop. So in our potable water and wastewater section, um, we take away, again, those items that may be addressed elsewhere, like in the building code. Um, and one of the big changes is really just saying, let's look at the vulnerability of our, our infrastructure and determine um, how we can plan for that. Um, and it does remove one policy that states that the board is the, one, is the entity that sets the, rate, the water rates. Um, but the main reason why we remove that is because that is specifically addressed in the county code in the utilities section, and it sets up that responsibility. So it really does not belong in the comprehensive plan itself. For the solid waste section, um, it identifies our advisory group, which is the technical management committee, um, which is really the county communicating and, and coordinating with our municipal partners and how collection occurs. It adds the policy to implement our solid waste master plan, which addresses programmatic things and, and will make recommendations possibly to, um, to amend our county code to meet um, our desire to go towards zero waste. Uh, it removes policies relating to franchise collection contracts. Now, I will, I, I do want to make the point that it doesn't preclude our ability to use that tool. That is a tool that we still have the opportunity to use, although our, our solid waste team really does not pursue that because it's a very complex um, process. So because it's not something that they really identify as something they would uh, choose to move forward with, they said, let's take it out of the comprehensive plan as long as we're we're sure that it is something we could pursue if we so choose. Uh, we also removed the hazmat response because that's a federal um, action. It's uh, FDEP is the one who would respond to um, the, those types of situations. It's not our, our uh, purview. And similarly, um, we removed a legal disposal response saying that our solid waste team uh, is responsible for that. Um, and that's because they are not Right now, the, the process that we use is contracting with Keep Pinellas Beautiful, and we, that's how these actions are carried out. Um, so it, again, doesn't preclude things from happening, but it, doesn't, it, it more uh, appropriately reflects what's occurring with our team. Um, and it also identifies um, looking at environmentally sound collection and disposal, of course, being fiscally sound, having fiscally sound management, it removes specific fees um, from the document, and the reason for that is because they want to have the opportunity to, to pursue a number of different fees, and they don't want it to seem as though it's lim the comp plan is limiting the opportunities for fees. Uh, and similarly, as I mentioned in, in um, a different chapter, we're looking at how um, is our uh, infrastructure uh, impacted and vulnerable, and so it's limiting and moving um, solid waste facilities outside of the coastal high hazard area. So our lifelong learning section is our, currently our public facilities chapter, and really what this does, it, it keeps um, the school district interlocal agreement or reflects that, uh, but it expands our conversation by saying, how do we uh, ensure access for our community to training resources and to um, our facilities and different opportunities for our community to have access. And in our governance section, again, that's a new title. It incorporates a number of our existing chapters, including intergovernmental coordination, our capital improvements elements, and the recently adopted uh, property rights element. All of that would be housed within this governance section. We've added a new goal to reflect the desire for, to uh, address decisions looking at healthy outcomes for our community, so it has a public health goal as well. 
Um, and one thing I want to identify here is that it removes the specific amount associated with our tourist tax collection. It still identifies that tax, but if, similarly, if, if that percentage happens to change over time, you don't want to have to go back into the comprehensive plan document to amend it. Uh, and one, uh, one other um, note there also is that it adds a strategy to say, let's look at a number of different funding sources of how we can support our transportation system. Before you. Please. <laughs> The ads policies, the equitable access to learning opportunities, yeah. is that basically we're just referring to the school districts completely, or when we talk about access, are we also talking about libraries? 100%, yeah, so thank you for that. It, it does, it talks about how do we coordinate with our partners. It's the school districts, it's our businesses, understanding what kind of needs they have for their, for their industries. It's working with uh, our libraries and our community centers and organizations. So it's really, the, the approach is really that coordination piece. So it's more the, core, it's not actually, and again, I, I don't mean to harp on the specifics, no but that, that uh, in other plans I've seen other entities take, we want to have a community park within X miles of every. Yeah, no, again, it's not the specific uh, it's not the specific actions that would happen out of the policy. It's the policy policy that says look at these things okay. and make recommendations of how we can improve access. Very good. All right. Thank you. And so that that's the general summary. I'm happy to answer any questions, but I just want to share our upcoming schedule. So as mentioned earlier, we will be meeting with our developer advisory group at the end of this month. I believe it's March 25th, and then we're hoping to come back with the transmittal hearing uh, this spring. And then uh, by the end of the year, hopefully in fall, we would go for adoption after the state comments have come in and we're able to address those. Questions? Commissioner Seal. That working? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I did have a chance to um, meet with Rebecca and to go over a lot of my questions, but I still have um, maybe two areas that I'm a little, um, three areas that I'm concerned about. And one would probably have to go back to forward Pinellas. But if safety is going to be the overarching um, criteria and plan for the county, um, if you look at the bike lanes that are proposed and that exist, I think we really need to take a good look at it because I think there's areas where it's not safe to put a bike, say on US 19, um, for instance. And um, so I think we probably should um, ask Forward Pinellas to take a better look at that with the safety lens of where is it appropriate to have bike lanes on what kind of roads. And so, um, Wanted to bring that up, and then the other thing, and um, Commissioner Flowers, you're on the homeless leadership group. Um, one of the um, strategies is to provide opportunities for the through the county for emergency shelters. And when I was on the homeless leadership board, I know it was a housing first approach that was being taken that we should be looking for permanent housing. Um, emergency shelters, in my opinion, and if you talk with the staff, don't really address homelessness. And so I hesitate to have this being one of our key strategies. Instead, I think we should be talking about, and Rebecca did respond to that, that housing first could be put into this, which I think would follow, you know, what we're trying to accomplish in Pinellas County. Sorry, keep forgetting to push my button. Good observation. We have talked about this a lot. As a matter of fact, I have a board meeting tomorrow, so I'll bring up um, the, the concern. Um, we've talked a lot about um, the level of housing and how we prioritize based on the funding that we get, whether it's for rapid rehousing, whether it's for transitional housing or emergency housing. So I will certainly uh, bring that up tomorrow at our board meeting. We as far as I've seen since I've been on that board, are looking towards housing permanency, but there are so many things that some of those persons require in between that permanency housing at that point is not attainable mm -hmm. because they don't have 
some of the um, wraparound services needed in order for them to uh, move in that direction at that point. But I will certainly bring that up. That's a good point. Thank you for sharing. Well, um, it's actually May 